Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to, uh, I believe, is this episode 10 this already? This is it. Episode 10, 10, Tyler, of Numero the Cutting 10. Edge Podcast. So uh, it is a warm, sunny day in Dallas, Texas. It is, but much cooler than it has been the last few weeks. We had a little cold front this week. 48 degrees on Tuesday night. Did you know that? It was not. 48 degrees, but it, it warmed up so fast in the morning, nobody knew it. Wow. That's yeah. incredible for June in Texas. Yeah, that it was, never, it was I mean, not a record, but it almost was. No kidding. Yeah. Well, you know, this is going to be a fun episode today. So this takes me back to early in my career uh, working in the obesity medicine field. Okay. Uh, so I'm glad you didn't say McDonald's. No, not not that early. Okay. okay. Not that, I never worked at McDonald's. <laughs> but uh, so the, the title of our episode today is The Skinny on Weight Loss. Okay. Uh, a little topic. bit of a play on words, but yeah, it's super hot topic given the state of our society and, and uh, just the state of medicine as well. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of attention being paid to uh, the disease of obesity coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, we're... We're going to get into our uh, topic here and our guests momentarily, but before we get started, we wanted to make a few mentions to the folks that support our show. So uh, Texas Assist, Surgical Assist Staffing uh, here in Dallas, uh, Carrington Advisors, which happens to be Tyler, your firm, mm -hmm. uh, full service uh, family office, and uh, can't thank you enough for being part of that support yeah. group. You bet. Uh, we've got Jen Eaton at Moonshot Marketing Group. So Jen... Uh, thanks for all you do for us with our social media support. Had to lean on her today, coincidentally, to help us get our LinkedIn uh, page back connected to our Hootsuite account. I know. She she pushes all of this stuff out for us. And she did tell me she just wishes we were a little bit better looking. So, well, was, you have the perfect faces for radio, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we thank them. You know, Ortho Lone Star has been uh, a faithful supporter here as well here recently. Great group. Looking forward to having uh, the Carroll Clinic, one of their member groups on with us next week. Uh, so, you know, for those of us that are listening for the first time, we would hope you'd join us, uh, whether it's via our LinkedIn page, it's our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Um, you can also find us on Instagram, although we've had some issues there, but uh, certainly would love for you to join us and follow as we have some great content, not only today, but some great content in the past and some mm -hmm. great content going forward, some awesome guests. So with that, all that being said, I think we want to go ahead and jump in. You know, we usually spend about 45 minutes with our guests. And uh, today we have joining us, Dr. Robert Ziltzer. Did I pronounce that correctly? You did. Awesome. So Dr. Ziltzer uh, joins us. Uh, his practice is in Scottsdale, but you're joining us from San Diego today, correct? That's correct. So uh, tell us a little bit, Dr. Zilzer, about your uh, your current situation, not situation, but your profession in the obesity medicine field. So I started off in primary care, uh, board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics. And for the first half of my career, the first 15 years or so, I spent much of my time treating diabetes and high blood pressure complications of, of obesity, but I, you know, our system really is not geared towards treating obesity. We put people on drugs for all those conditions. And I had always said, if I can figure out a way to help people lose 50 pounds or more, I'm going to give up doing and keep it off. I'm going to give up doing primary care and, and do full-time obesity medicine. And the field was fairly young back then. Uh, that was uh, about 16 years ago. And uh, so 2006, I moved into full-time obesity medicine and stopped doing primary care. And now I get to take people off blood pressure pills and diabetes pills and help people get healthier and happier and live their, live their best lives. Uh, such a, a difference from primary care where people kind of get sicker and sicker over time. Uh, so uh, I'm now one of the co-founders of Scottsdale Weight Loss Center. We have four centers uh, throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Glendale, and Chandler. And we have um, five clinicians spread throughout the valley. So we, we cover the largest part of uh, the population of Arizona. That's awesome. So is this, uh, is this a first love treating obesity or is this something that 
you know, it, it just has grown on you. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, how did you get into, or how'd you come to the realization that treating obesity as a disease was something you wanted to do as a profession? I, when I went through medical school and residency, I never would have imagined I would have ended up treating obesity full time. But when you, when you start treating all these conditions and realize that you're treating hypertension and the cause of their hypertension is weight gain. However, our systems kind of uh, incentivizes putting people on pills. So if you put people on enough pills, you can control their, their blood pressure, but you're not really controlling the underlying cause. Same thing with diabetes. Uh, pretty much every organ in your body is affected by weight gain, including arthritis, you know, hip replacements and knee replacements and strokes, heart attacks, um, uh, cancer, uh, many cancers, their primary cause is, is weight gain and obesity. If a woman gains only 20 pounds of weight during her middle years from, from her 20s on, uh, her risk of breast cancer will double. So I realized that I wasn't really helping people. Uh, ultimately, I wasn't changing lives. And back in uh, the early 90s, I started a small weight loss practice and found just how gratifying it was. And uh, over time became more and more experienced. And I realized that, you know, I can, I can just do much more for people when I treat their weight. They're much happier, they feel better. Um, what charges me is getting someone who could, who could not walk a block and now they're able to run a 5K or run a marathon. And uh, it, it really is about impacting lives, changing lives for the better, improving lives. Interesting. Well, so, you know, so Tyler, he said something really interesting. He said, he used the term treat their weight. And, you know, I, I recall, and, and this is interesting, even my primary care doctor before I made a switch uh, didn't believe that obesity was a disease, right? It was the old adage of, You've, you've always heard about primary care doctors say, well, just stop eating, you know, just eat less, mm -hmm. right? Exercise more. Dr. Zilcher, can you talk about the disease of obesity and just the common misconception? Because our, our listening audience, uh, although primarily made up of healthcare practitioners, we have a lot of lay people that have Absolutely. connected with us that come from different walks of life. And we know that the disease of obesity and, and being overweight touches a lot of people. Maybe talk about kind of the, the underlying disease, how many people does it touch and why has it taken so long for our society to accept that it is a disease? There's an incredible weight bias against obesity. And I, I think you've touched upon one of the main myths that, that the solution is just to eat less and, and move more. And boy, wouldn't it be nice if it were that simple? Uh, one third of the American population has obesity. One third of our population has overweight and only one third of our population is normal. So the, the rates of obesity have, have skyrocketed. So the question is, you know, why is it a disease? And I try to liken it to hypertension or diabetes. So these are conditions caused by a metabolic abnormality that causes consequences to your health. For example, if you have high blood pressure from any cause, it could be from obesity, it could be from a kidney problem, or most people with hypertension, high blood pressure, have um, what's called essential hypertension, where uh, we don't ever find a reason why they have it. Um, if you don't treat it, they will have consequences, heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure. And if you put them on a medication to lower their blood pressure, then you'll reduce those health consequences. And obesity is, is the same. If you allow someone, someone uh, there's a, a term healthy obesity, uh, healthy fat. So if someone uh, feels good about themselves and they haven't yet manifested consequences, health consequences, uh, there's an argument that, that uh, society will make that, well, they're not really being affected by their weight, but just like high blood pressure, they haven't been affected by their weight yet. 
Same thing with diabetes. You know, if, if someone's blood sugar is high, it can lead to heart attacks, strokes, uh, kidney failure, blindness, leading cause of blindness. So uh, when you normalize someone's blood sugars, you reduce the risk of all those consequences. So if you, if you take the approach that, um, you know, you just have poor willpower, you should just move more and, and eat less, it never works. No one is able to successfully lose weight uh, without a serious plan. Now, a few people can do it on their own. A few people can make the needed changes that will control their weight without help. Um, but uh, as we'll talk about uh, later, there's reasons why people regain and why it is so difficult to do on your own and why doing it with help can be so successful. So there's this whole field of obesity medicine where physicians who um, have an interest in obesity can go through a path uh, to become certified by the American Board of Obesity Medicine. So you go through uh, an extensive amount of conferences and education and experience, and then you take an exam. And if you pass that exam, then you can say that you are certified by the American Board of Obesity Medicine. Uh, and that's the path that I've chosen. And again, I, I limit my practice to, to this wonderful field. And it's so exciting now because we're getting more and more tools to treat the condition. Right. You know, Tyler, you're kind of looking at me like just, I don't know if it's perplexed or surprised. I mean, what are you thinking based on what you've heard so far? You know, I think what resonates to me at this is that there are so many people out there that are struggling with weight loss and they um they you know they are eating less and they are moving more and they are active but uh society and, and, and society is such a big player in this because i mean you know when you look at our all the different ways that we communicate with one another through social media what does Hollywood tell us? What is what is you know you know what do movie stars tell us? What are, all these people have this you know um, this aura about them that ever you know you're skinny and everybody should you know be fit and all of this and plus uh, you know I think about the the you know weight loss industry. I mean it's a it's a multi bajillion dollar industry. Oh, he pulled it up. See, we're on the same page. Seventy one billion dollar industry. Uh, we talked about that on a, another podcast a few months back. It, 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 it's all very fascinating to me, and it's great to know, to be honest. I, I was not aware that there are literally doctors that only specialize in obesity. Um, so it, it's all it's all interesting. I'm soaking it in right now, CJ. I'm just an average Joe. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, you know, part of the reason we have you on the show is, right, you bring a different perspective. You're not in the medical profession. So very curious to hear your thoughts. But you know, Doc, one of the things that we hear uh, about other conditions or other disease states is there's genetic predispositions to be at higher risk for certain types of cancer, certain types of other diseases. Does that exist with obesity? Has there been enough evidence to support that people are at a genetic predisposition to be obese? based on family history or based on other things? Speak to that a little bit. Absolutely. Genetics play a significant role as does environment. So if you have, uh, the, so if you assume that the normal rate uh, of obesity is, uh, is around 33% of the population, um, if you have one parent who struggles with obesity, their children have a double the risk. So about a 66% risk of obesity if both of your parents have obesity, then about 95% of their children will also have obesity at some point in their lives. So genetics are a huge, huge role. Um, and um, uh, so that, that really, and, and if you do uh, twin studies, so identical twins versus uh, non-identical twins, you'll see that those that have the same genes, their weights track each other much more so than with, um, fraternal twins, the non-identical type twins. Wow. So tell us about the scale for obesity. What What is considered obese? What is considered overweight? What is considered normal? Is there, uh, what's the measure of that? 
So currently we use a term called body mass index. It is far from perfect. And it is simply taking into account your weight and your height. So it has nothing to do with whether you're a man or a woman. Uh, it, it is affected by age. So this is strictly an adult measure. There's also another scale for children. So the BMI body mass index, uh, 19 to 25 is considered a normal body mass index. 25 to 30, which is up to around 30 pounds overweight, uh, puts you in the overweight range. Once you hit around 30 pounds of excess body weight, uh, your BMI goes over 30. So 30 and up is the term we use for uh, obesity. So anything over 30, and typically we start talking about surgery, you know, over 35 to 40. And certainly uh, those that are in the BMI of say, you know, 50 to 60 or more, many, you know, many of those uh, will not be able to lose their weight without doing actually bariatric surgery. No, now why, why is that? So is there a certain threshold or level that someone gets and it doesn't matter what they do, they just flat cannot lose weight? Um, when your BMI goes over 40, you are now approximately 100 pounds overweight, and that's a lot of weight to lose. The tools that we have medically are really good for the 30 to 100, 125 pound uh, overweight. But once you get much above that, the medications that we have, the diets that we have right now um, aren't as effective. Now we can get some, even 5% of weight loss makes, makes a huge difference. You can cut your risk of diabetes and hypertension by 50% just with 5% weight loss. So small amounts of weight loss do make a difference. However, someone who's 200 pounds overweight, it is very difficult to get them to a normal weight. What it really comes down to is understanding these, their hormones that affect our metabolism and affect our appetite. And if you understand this concept, it'll make it make it really clear why is it that people who lose weight are so likely to regain. I'll start with a hormone called leptin. And leptin is made in the fat cells. As your fat cells get bigger, they make more and more leptin. The fat is not just a passive storage organ. The fat is actually a hormonal organ. As your fat cells get bigger, they make more leptin and leptin has many effects on the body. One of them is to reduce appetite. So when it circulates through the bloodstream and hits the area of the brain, the, the um, appetite, appetite center called the hypothalamus, it reduces appetite. So as your body has more leptin, you get more hungry. Uh, more leptin, you get less hungry, sorry. Um, uh, leptin also raises metabolism. So there's a reason why someone who weighs 300 pounds can eat 3,000 calories and not gain weight. But when they lose a bunch of weight, their fat cells shrink. They make less leptin, which increases your appetite, resulting from less leptin and also raises your lowers your metabolism. When your metabolism is lower, you can't eat as much. So someone who weighs now you know, 140 pounds can only eat maybe 1,400 calories a day. There's another hormone made in the lining of the stomach called ghrelin. And ghrelin is a hunger hormone and it goes up before each meal and when you eat it comes down. So uh, just think of it as a signal to eat. And when you see your favorite foods that actually raises ghrelin. As your weight goes up, your ghrelin levels tend to go down. However, when you lose weight, your ghrelin levels markedly drop, which makes you hungry all the time. And ultimately, when you take these, the effects of weight loss on lower leptin, and, uh, uh, lower leptin uh, and lower ghrelin, that results in more hunger and lower metabolism, the more weight you lose. So I kind of think of a bungee cord, the more weight you lose, the more it wants to spring back. Mm. Yeah, I, that was a really, I'm glad he, you know, created a metaphor for that because I was, I was going, man, how do I comprehend this? But at the end of the day, someone, let's say that's a hundred pounds overweight, let's say they're able to lose 30 or 40 or 50 pounds because the ghrelin, is that right? Gets lower, their metabolism 
is lower. They eat more and end up gaining the weight right back. Is that right? Yeah, let, let me let me correct that. Sorry. So ghrelin goes up with weight loss. Okay, goes up. Ghrelin goes up. So these peaks, so your appetite goes up uh, and ghrelin goes down. So you, what you want is to have, you'd, you'd prefer to have less ghrelin and more leptin, but when you lose weight, your peaks and trough levels of ghrelin go way higher, which makes you more hungry. The opposite of what you would want, but unfortunately that's our body's way of survival. We are built to survive. As we lose weight, our, our bodies wanna preserve body fat for storage for the ultimate famine. And in this, in this uh, generation, that's never gonna happen. So I think we're gonna get into technique, but what I'm hearing is, is that it's possible that there needs to be a steady approach to the way that you do this so that you can keep those things balanced. Is that? That's exactly right. Obesity is a not only a disease, may AMA declared in 2013 that obesity is a medical disease, but it's also a chronic medical disease, which means we have no cure based upon, again, today's science. Now that may change. We don't have a pill. You know, when you get a sinus infection or a strep throat, you take an antibiotic and you are cured. So at the end of your antibiotic treatment, unless it comes back at another time, you are now cured. However, conditions like high blood pressure, like diabetes, even cancer, you know, if someone has their cancer controlled, we say they're in remission. But even 30 years later, someone who's had breast cancer can have a recurrence of their breast cancer. So you must take a long-term approach, which means that you have to get someone in, in treatment, you have to get it under control. So we have various measures that we use to get their weight down. And then you need to continue some lifelong treatment. And if you stop that treatment, just like stopping a blood pressure pill, their blood pressure will go up, same, th same thing with, with weight. If you stop treatment, typically people regain because of this higher ghrelin and lower leptin levels. That's interesting. You know. There's been so much movement in the last 10 years, especially in therapeutics, right? And, and not just in weight loss, um, but generally in therapeutics across the board, with different disease states where we've become, we've been able to understand so much more about how the body functions and how it reacts to certain chemical compounds, uh, especially with some of these designer drugs. Can you talk to us about, uh, kind of the history of therapeutics in weight loss. You know, obviously there's, you can't hardly turn the TV on without somebody making a promise about use this product and you'll lose weight, you know, use this and you'll never be hungry again. You know, help us kind of decode reality versus myth when it comes to therapeutics and options. Currently there are no non-prescription uh supplements that will lead to more than a pound or two of weight loss so let's just make it clear that uh people can make claims in the field of herbal medicine and homeopathic medicine and they don't need to back it up they don't need to go to the fda to get approval to make that statement because they put that statement on the bottom they always have that asterisk these statements have not been evaluated by the fda and what that means is we can make any statement we want and we'll rely on placebo effect. And as we know, placebos, sugar pills, even work some percent of the time. You know, a, a clock is, is right twice a day, right? Um, so I'll take you through the prescription medications. So back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, the medications that we used were stimulants. Uh, one of them commonly is, is called fentermine. And phenamine both lowers appetite and raises metabolism. And over time, some people have tried using high doses of thyroid. So these are supplements. These are, are prescription medications that use that we use to treat an underactive thyroid. And when you give someone large amounts of them, you can raise their metabolism. But the problem is that rarely do people lose weight because they end up actually being more hungry when you give them large amounts of thyroid. This is actually what they use, what they give horses during during races, and I think it actually is legal uh, for horses. Yeah. So it does raise metabolism, but you don't really see weight loss. 
Uh, you just see people getting anxious. Uh, they can develop arrhythmias of the heart, so rapid heart rate, uh, heart failure from uh, excessive strain on the heart. Uh, so uh, thyroid is, is not a, an acceptable treatment. Uh, over the years, there are medications that have come out and had untoward side effects and were removed from the market. For example, in the 90s, fenfen was highly effective. So fenfen was fentramine with a serotonin uh, stimulating medication called fenfluramine. When you, when you use large amounts of fenfluramine, it actually caused heart valve problems. So fenfluramine was banned, but fentramine was cleared at that time and is still quite, a, quite an effective medication. We uh, later uh, uh, introduced to uh, a drug called Contrave, which is great for cravings and that's still available today. And Contrave has Wellbutrin plus naltrexone. So Wellbutrin is used for uh, ADD and for uh, depression, uh, but we also use it for addictive type behaviors and it's great for cravings, especially when combined with naltrexone. And then over the past, uh, 10 years, uh, well, there's, so uh, uh, later on, uh, right around the time Contrave came out, fentramine was combined with a seizure drug called topiramate, which markedly increased the, uh, the efficacy and the weight loss with fentramine by itself. Um, we, we have other drugs that we'll sometimes use uh, that aren't FDA approved for weight loss. However, the last say five to 10 years have brought a whole new class of drugs called GLP-1 drugs, glucagon-like peptide drugs. These are drugs that are secreted from the intestine in response to eating. So when you eat, these levels go up and they tell you to eat less. They, uh, they tell you to, to stop eating. That's one of the, one of the main uh, reasons why we feel full after, after eating. However, the molecule that our body makes only lasts a few minutes in our blood. Through uh, kind of the magics of pharmaceuticals, they've modified these molecules initially to last a few days. And now we have these molecules that, uh, that have a one week half-life. So we now have this whole new class of drugs that, that can be given by generally a micro injection, one of them by a pill. And they are really the biggest breakthrough in obesity medicine in, uh, in really decades. Uh, they lead to significant amounts of weight loss and make weight loss just way, way easier for patients. You have to remember that the medications are only effective when combined with the right meal plan. So the reason to see a medical doctor is to put you on the, the right meal plan. And uh, generally it's either a lower carb diet, a lower calorie diet, uh, potentially uh, medical nutrition, which is the use of specialized uh, uh, meal replacement shakes, soups and bars. So one of those diets is typically gonna be right for each patient. So, uh, so I, yeah. I heard a couple of different things here. So I heard that potentially and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is that there's potentially the use of, there's off-label use of certain medications in medical weight loss. There's certainly been breakthroughs with other medications that uh, are, are creating what you're calling significant weight loss. So let's take those two things in two different parts. So talk to us about off-label use of medications. Some people, medical professionals will have heard that term before, but folks who are not medical pro professionals may not know what that means. Help us under, help our audience understand what that means. There are lots of drugs for which when they were brought to market, they were, they were allowed to come to market through the FDA at a specific dose for a specific duration of time and for a specific population. Many of the drugs that we use to treat children, the, the drug company never did studies on those drugs. Cholesterol medicines, for example, uh, may not have been FDA approved for children. However, children with very high cholesterol, um, just through experience, decades of, of doctors using it, we found that the benefits of those drugs far outweigh the risks. So 
at the end of the day, a patient and a doctor will come to a decision as to do the benefits of treatment outweigh the risks. So it's what we call the risk benefit ratio. And as long as you are looking out for your patient and you inform your patient, hey, this is not the way that drug was initially approved. However, let's decide if this is gonna be in your best interest. And if it is, then a doctor can prescribe it for that patient for a use that may not have been intended. Antibiotics, for example, commonly are used for an infection that will cover bacteria for which that, that antibiotic will kill the germs, but it wasn't originally FDA approved for that particular condition. That's called off-label use. So we do that all the time. Gotcha. So let's talk about the second part of that, which is significant weight loss. As, as a medical weight loss professional, what do you consider significant weight loss? A minimum of 5% weight loss is considered significant, meaning enough to make a difference in a, in a patient's health. Uh, we like to see 15% total weight loss. So uh, that's 30 pounds weight loss in a 200 pound individual. And that is pretty routine for us. We typically see around 16 to 17% weight loss in, in our patients. And as long as they stick with us, they'll keep that weight off. Now, uh, everybody has their goals and I leave it up to my patients to decide, you know, what is your goal? What do you want to achieve? Some people who I, I may have a patient who weighs 250 pounds, they'll be happy at 220, even though they will still be considered in the obesity range. And if that's what they want to achieve and they're healthier than they were at 250, then I'm in 100% support of that. But if they want to be at their normal weight, then we'll do everything uh, to, to get them there and then to keep them there. Uh, so it, it's really a, a very personal thing. Each, each person carries within them their expectation of how much weight they want to lose. Is there such a thing as everybody having a, a set weight? I've heard that term growing up. Is that a fallacy? Because of these hormonal changes, it is uncanny how someone who has weighed 200 pounds and they lose weight and then they stop eating healthy and they stop exercising and, and uh, are no longer under our supervision, how quickly they will go back to that 200 pound weight. So I kind of I kind of see it as, you know, so they're 200 pounds, then they lose weight and when they gain more weight because of more stress in their lives, they'll often go even higher. And that now becomes their new set point. And I believe that is due to these hormonal changes, the resetting of leptin and ghrelin and the fact that when you lose weight, your body fights to get back to that weight. So it's probably not a single point, it's more of a set range. But we learned from the Biggest Loser study, here's a group of, of people who lost uh, uh, 120 pounds on average. And within five years, they had regained 90 of those 120 pounds. Okay. Wow. And they were still on their on their uh, trajectory to, to regain. Were all those, were the majority of those people still under treatment? No, uh, typically these are people who did, who were in the Biggest Loser uh, uh, pro TV program and they lost a bunch of weight and they tried on their own and probably didn't see an obesity medicine physician. They didn't see a clinician with expertise in obesity medicine. And they, they're trying on their own. And uh, sadly, uh, they find that they can't. They just can't eat low enough calories. They can't exercise enough to maintain that weight on their own. There's the rare person that does, but it is really truly rare. Interesting. William, one of the things that caused me to reach out to you to, to join us as a guest was a, a publication regarding a breakthrough weight loss study uh, with an existing medication that's being used to treat diabetes. You want to speak to our audience about uh, that particular study? I don't want to mispronounce the, uh, the medication name, uh, but I, it, it, it seems very, very promising what that breakthrough has been in terms of the treatment of obesity. We, we've been using these GLP-1 drugs 
uh, again, for a number of years. And one of the drugs, Ozempic, uh, which is um, uh, used for diabetes, uh, semaglutide is the uh, generic name of the medication and Ozempic is the brand name. Uh, that drug we've been using uh, to treat diabetes and up to one milligrams, that's the highest dose that's FDA approved for diabetes. The same drug was just approved called Wegovi, also semaglutide uh, for 2.4 milligrams. And it has led to an average weight loss of 15%. And 15% for a drug using not even a very aggressive diet is really dramatic. The placebo group lost three or 4%. So this is a, a major breakthrough and patients who, who have struggled with weight their whole lives are truly finding that they just can't eat as much as they used to eat, like 50%. Um, we wrote a book uh, called Chasing Diets, where we talk about the struggles of people with obesity and why obesity is, is a disease. We talk about how people go from diet to diet to diet. And our average patient has lost, you know, lost and regained. They've been on typically a dozen diets by the time they've come to us. You're talking to one of those guys right here. I mean, that's, that's yes. my life story. It's, 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 it's everybody's journey. Uh, we, we do get the occasional patient who's never dieted before, but that's, that's really the, the minority. And uh, we're finding that semaglutide for people who have struggled and have kind of tried everything, that this has made such a huge, huge difference. And we, we are so excited about these new developments in the world of obesity because, you know, losing 5% is significant, but 15% of your body weight, that's life changing. Oh, it's cr that's so, crazy. So if, if you guys are having that level of success with this drug, is, does that just mean that you're gonna prescribe this to everybody? I mean, why try anything else if you're having that level of success? There are uh, cost concerns. The drug uh, costs around $1,300 and some insurances aren't covering it. And that's one of the biggest challenges is getting insurance companies to treat the underlying condition because insurances are not in many states required to cover obesity. The most common medical condition that exists and insurances don't have to cover it. Mm. Man, it just it raises so many questions about, you know, I, one of the one of the big questions that I have is how much resistance do you get from your uh, colleagues in the medical field to send you patients when they know you're having success? They know you have this specific board certification. You know, in, in your particular metropolitan area in, in Phoenix, do you have a, a, a pretty good following of, of practitioners that will refer you patients or how, how are people finding you? A large percent of our patients do come from physicians, physician referrals, and uh, it, is, it is changing. I think there is the perception amongst many healthcare professionals that weight loss is futile that people can't lose weight or they can't keep it off. So they have patients who have lost and regained and they don't understand that just like you don't stop a blood pressure pill that's working, you can't stop a weight loss plan that's working. So you have to, uh, the, the other uh, issue is that we have physicians who have told their patients to lose weight and because they they didn't know how to talk to their patients. They didn't know how to inspire them. They often uh, dug themselves into a hole. For example, they'll, they'll tell their patient, you know, you really need to lose weight. And the patient will often get very defensive and the, and the doctor will, will quickly realize, well, I'm not gonna ever bring that up again. But instead, if you, if you say to your patient, hey, hey, I noticed that your, as your weight's gone up, your blood pressure's gone up, your blood sugar's, have gone up, do you want help with your weight? Because I think that would make a huge difference. When the, 
the, then you have to listen to your patient. And when the patient says, you know, I've, I've tried all these diets before, or I'm really not interested, then all you need to say to them is, I 100% I understand. Let me know when you're ready and then leave it at that. And when you do that, you plant that seed. And at some point that patient may come back and say, do you remember when you told me that there was a, a, a actually treatment for this condition that I have and I don't have to struggle on my own? Well, I think I'm ready now. And, and it takes a lot of patience. That's incredible. Yeah. So, you know, as we wind up our time together, because man, this has gone so quickly. You've provided so much information. How many uh, board certified obesity medicine specialists are there in the United States? Uh, I think we're now up to around 3000. Uh, there are every year there's a board exam. So a whole new slew There's probably another 800 or a thousand doctors in the last year that have become certified in obesity medicine. So, you know, we're growing, but still there's not enough of us to treat all the all the patients with obesity out are, there. Are most, um, it, it's a growing field, yeah. Yeah, are most of most of you that are board medicine or board certified in obesity medicine, are you coming from primary care? Or are you coming from uh, other specialties like rheumatology? I mean, I, I think about other specialties where there's uh, high volumes of patients where obesity is an underlying condition. What does that look like? Any idea? all walks of medicine, you, in order to be uh, certified in obesity medicine, you have to have a another specialty. So there are many that are internal medicine doctors or family medicine uh, practitioners, uh, pediatricians, uh, but there's many who come from specialties, surgeons who then go on to uh, treat both surgically and medically, uh, endocrinologists and, and uh, OBGYN. So, you, you can, you, there isn't a field that isn't affected by obesity, that isn't treating conditions for which obesity is affecting their patients. So you can come from any field. Interesting. It's fascinating, it really is. It's, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Of course, it definitely makes you look in the mirror. <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> oh my gosh. Certainly, right? You become a little bit more conscious of all mm -hmm. I mean, I've been, I, I can, I can share with our audience that I've been under treatment with an obesity medicine specialist for what's going on about four years. And I've been one of those wanderers, had immediate success, did great. And oh, I can do this on my own, weight regain and back on the wagon. It's, it is, it is a disease. It is something that uh, you're not going to cure it has to be treated it has it has to be attended to we're trying to break through that shame that um, was associated in many ways with cancer back in the 50s so when someone had cancer their their friends kind of alienated them uh, it, they would whisper you know I, I I had cancer and now when you get treatment for a cancer you're a hero yeah. And I look forward to the time where people who get treatment for obesity are considered heroes. So that's that's my hope. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The last car I bought uh, just a few weeks ago, I walked into that dealership and I've dealt with the same guy for six or seven years, bought a couple of vehicles from him. Man, what have you been doing? And I told him and I said, look, I'm just going to send you her information. Call her. Go see her. Schedule an appointment no shame and you know i sent it to him and i came back in four days later to get the car mm -hmm. did you call her no man i just haven't gotten around to it i said okay listen we're gonna send her a text right now while i'm sitting here because as your friend i care about you mm -hmm. do it it's worth it mm -hmm. right like we we don't put that much care into each other's health when it comes to obesity, but we certainly do it when it comes to, hey, my knee hurts. And you, oh, you need a knee replacement? You need an orthopedic surgeon? Well, here's a here's a referral, right? We do it in all sorts of other walks of life. But I think it's, you said something key, Doc. Man, the, the shame to this needs to be put to the side because this is this can be the difference between being here or not being here because of a major life event, right? I mean, this is, 
This is big stuff. So I can't thank you enough for being with it, with us today and joining us to talk about this topic because this is front and center for a huge chunk of our population. Mm-hmm. And this is a taboo subject for a lot of people. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I'm not afraid to admit that I'm, I have obesity. I need treatment. I need help. And uh, there's a lot of other folks out there that I hope they hear this message and know that they're not alone. You've given us so much information. If you have one parting comment that you can share with our audience that's listening today, one thing that you could have hit home that people carry with them uh, that may be on the fence about what do I do, what would that be? What comment would you share? Most importantly, if you've tried on your own and failed, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. Get professional help. Find an obesity medicine physician in your community who uh, can help you make the journey easier and faster and safer uh, because our, our patients tell us that weight loss under our care is the easiest and fastest weight loss that they've ever experienced. And our job is to, is to, to make it an, an easier journey. Is there an easy way for patients to find a board certified physician that is an obesity medicine specialist? The largest group of physicians who are experts in obesity medicine is the Obesity Medicine Association. And there is a find a clinician tab where you can you can put in your zip code and it will find someone uh, nearby to you. Terrific. Awesome. Well, hey, docs, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I can't wait to get this out to our audience. I think this is going to get a lot of attention and a lot of traction and uh, exciting things ahead in the uh, in the area of weight loss uh, treatment. Uh, certainly stay in touch with us. We'd love to have a follow up podcast on this subject, uh, you know, whether that's a year from now, a couple of years from now, because we know that movement and therapeutics and treatment continues to evolve. And this is uh, this is a disease state that is not going to go away in our society. Well, thank you for having me, and I wish you well on your journey. Uh, what you'll find is that weight loss is contagious, and you have you have an opportunity to impact lives, and and certainly through this podcast and through your own sharing your your challenges and the and the fact that uh, you got help. Uh, that's huge, and and you'll you'll help other people in the process. So congratulations to you. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we're going to wrap it up for episode 10 of the Cutting Edge podcast. Uh, be, sur- be sure to join us next week. We will be having some esteemed guests from the Carroll Clinic joining us to talk through their 100-year anniversary, the oldest orthopedic practice west of the Mississippi. Is it Mr. Rick Weimer? Is it he is coming? Mr. Rick oh. Weimer, one of your favorite guests. It's one of so, my favorite guys. Doc, again, thanks. We're going to wrap it up here. Have a blessed afternoon. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, everybody.